Bonjour, good morning. My name is, can you please close the door? My name is Urs Kluser. Uh, I'm heading the UEFA Foundation for Children here in Nyon. And I would like to welcome you to the house uh, of UEFA in Nyon today. Um, first, some information on the translations. We have a consecutive translation into French, English. Uh, I think channel one is English, channel two Recording is... Recording in progress. And we are even being recorded, as you can hear. Um, uh, where you have French uh, is sec channel two. I think the, the headsets are uh, connected. So if you if you need the translation, please don't hesitate. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the representatives of here of the clubs and the NGOs um, of the wider region of Nyon uh, to come here today, and that you have found the time to be with us. Um, at the same time. Actually, also for you to know, I, I would like to welcome wholeheartedly the clubs that, uh, and the associations that are connected via our Facebook live stream. So I understand there's quite a number, um, uh, a lot from uh, the region in Cyprus, Greece, but also Europa-wide that are connected today, so that you are aware we are not just alone. We have a lot of friends listening today as well. Um, I wanted to say racism and discrimination, but after discussing with Clarence, I say inclusion is an issue not only in professional football. Um, our colleagues here in UEFA from, from competitions and uh, um, social and environmental sustainability, they do a great job in trying to regulate and to campaign for this issue. Um, but as we all know, it's an issue that is in our society and it remains a constant fight. So we are here in UEFA a lot to do with, with uh, professional football. We'll hear also about a little bit about uh, uh, football development uh, today. Um, but the, the bigger part of football is actually 98% of all football is amateur football. It's not all what we see in TV and, and uh, Champions League final, etc. The, the biggest part is the, is, the, is the level of amateur football. So it is highly important that we... Um, work with all stakeholders together um, to, to work on this issue. Three years ago, um, the foundation was contacted by Cardet, the project leader, um, if we would like to be part of a project uh, in researching and finding solutions for inclusion, and, and we gladly agreed. Um, the European Union, with its Erasmus Plus program, um, accepted the project and uh, they f provided the funding and we, of course, thank them for that. As many other projects, this project uh, was delayed by the pandemic. Also, in terms of cooperation, it wasn't always easy, but I think we, we still came to, to a good result. I think maybe it would have done a little bit differently and it wouldn't have taken so much time but at the end um, we are very glad today to present the results the final results and the recommendations on this platform the main objectives and you will hear more details about it uh, from our friends from Cardet are were to enhance the awareness and competencies of coaches and managers in football and to proactively manage and, um, the issue uh, around uh, inclusion and other forms of kind of, you know, um, discrimination that can happen. Um, the project has as a second objective to contribute and uh, uh, to the prevention and mitigation of the problems in grassroots football, and then to enhance the awareness on not only national but also transnational uh, level with the sports stakeholders as well as the public, so they are aware of the impact that this problem can have on players, on the grassroots football and sports in general. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, we have to thank the project partners uh, that are here today. Um, for their research, for their commitment and the hard work they invested in this project, namely CARDET, which is a, a, an organization NGO in Cyprus that works on educational issues, social uh, justice uh, and, and um, human rights. Then we have KMOP, which is a great Greek NGO that also works uh, in, in terms of in areas of education, human rights, um, sports and scientific research on these issues. Then we have our friends from Ireland, from SRC, which is a, um, a not-for-profit research centre um, that supports young ac academics uh, in, in their research around the issues. Um, and then, of course, we know FAIR. FAIR was part of the project, FAIR uh, network uh, from, the whole, from the Netherlands. Um, and the University of Pitest in Romania, 
um, helping us on the scientific research. Uh, also, they are specialists in physical education and sports. And then last but not least, the Institute of Development in Cyprus. So, this final conference uh, will be exploring the approaches and steps uh, for inclusion in football. The event hosted today by us, the UEFA Foundation, brings together legends um, and experts um, to share their experiences, but also perspectives and views um, on the necessary responses to this problem. Um, Additionally, uh, we will have uh, presenting uh, the tools that are now created and are uh, actually available uh, to support coaches to take an active stance uh, in making football a place that welcomes and celebrates all. We have um, today uh, a good agenda with Clarence, who will share his experience with us. Um, we have Charal. Lambos Vrasidas, Lambos Vrasidas from Cardet, who will give us the detail uh, of the project. And then Olivier, our colleague, will talk about uh, youth uh, elite development. And Emilio, I'm very happy that Emilio is here also. He's a, a local coach here from the uh, club in Prancha, so we have the real representation of uh, the grassroots level uh, talking about the inclusion today. But uh, let me start with uh, our keynote speaker. Uh, today is Clarence Seedorf. Clarence, for the ones who don't know him, maybe it's a generational issue, we all know him in our generation. Uh, he's a Dutch professional uh, football manager uh, and a former player. Um, he's regarded by many to be uh, one of the best midfielders ever in football, if I can say that, or at least in his generation. And here in this house, of course, we are very, uh, you know, we have to mention that he's one of the most successful Champions League uh, uh, players uh, in Champions League history, um, as he's the only player who has won, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but you have won with three different teams, four times the Champions League final, uh, once uh, with Ajax and then Real Madrid and twice with AC Milan. So uh, this is quite unique. But he has also played internationally. Uh, he has represented the Netherlands on 87 occasions, um, took part in the U UEFA European Championships. Um, he was, I think, 96, uh, 2000, 2004, and then you were at the World Cup in, in 98, and all in three tournaments you reached the semifinals, I guess missing the last part, but maybe there's hope. <laughs> so, just to say this, Clarence is not only, you know, doesn't didn't shine just as a footballer. Um, he is also very much engaged in many social uh, development projects and charitable activities. Um, among others, I know in his native country of Suriname, he has done a lot of work for the children. Um, he's also now on the, he will be on the board uh, in, in the supervisory board, I think KNVB, the Dutch uh, um, uh, National Associations. Um, uh, so, and additionally, he's committed to foundation and social causes. Uh, so he's particularly qualified today to talk about these issues at hand because um, it has been one of his subjects uh, and occupations uh, for the last uh, years. Um, and mainly, I think, most, last but not least for us, we are very proud to, um, that he's now an active board member since last year of the EFA Foundation for Children. And we are very glad to have him among us today. And um, I ask you to give a big applause uh, for um, Clarence to come on stage and give his view on the issue on inclusion. Thank you so much. It's always a bit embarrassing. I would like to be introduced when I'm out of the room. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just I, I can't get used to it, really. Uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, it's it's uh, always um, amazing to meet people who are occupying their uh, daily lives with uh, trying to make this world a bit better, starting with that. Um, so I have a huge respect for any effort that goes in the direction of uh, improving the world, and there's much to do. And uh, the more we work together, the more we can achieve uh, for sure. On this specific topic, and I haven't prepared anything because uh, it's not just a few years, but my whole life actually I've been either living uh, uh, this issue uh, and, and fighting myself to, to become, um, you know, uh, to live my dream uh, with all the obstacles that the society has uh, posed for me, uh, for my family, for my friends. Um, so beyond being uh, 
today part of an organization who tries to help others. I've been, um, I can consider myself an expert on both sides. So um, starting with that, um, I've been talking a lot about the power of communication, the wording that we use to tackle racism. And to tackle racism is not here, but it was somewhere before. Anywhere, um, the word racism is, uh, is is very particular because not not um, everybody's racist. Uh, there's a lot of racist behavior in football, but that doesn't mean that those people are necessarily racist. It's pretty delicate. Um, I give an example about um, big brands, when they communicate, they communicate their brands. They talk about their brand. They want their brand out there, you know, by me. Um, and what we're doing constantly is we're talking about racism. I showed before a picture of an armband where we have no racism and respect under it. And in the angle, it practically you see respect racism doesn't make sense, right? So why do we continue to use the word racism? Um, as a coach, I would hardly talk about the adversary as a strategy, because I make it bigger. I make it more important, um, especially when you play against the big teams. No need to tell my players to focus on Real Madrid or a Juventus all the time. I read a talk about what are we going to do to be the best version of ourselves. That as a philosophy um, encourages the players to really think about themselves and about the values we represent. Um, and I continue to see communications going that we're going to fight racism, we're going to tackle racism, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And the words of inclusion, equality, and diversity, which is used a lot, I know, but still, I would prefer that rather than to see racism all over the place because we're promoting racism unconsciously. It's a fact. Because the brands, the biggest brands in the world, Nike does not talk about Adidas in their campaigns, and vice versa. There is a reason for it. So why don't we start, first of all, to focus on communicating the world we want to have, where we want to go. If it's an inclusive world, then that has to be right in the spotlight all the time. This is a suggestion. It's a communication that I've had for many years with the uh, head of communications here, even in OEFA, uh, because the intentions are great. I'm not take, talking about the intentions. I really talk about what is the deeper messaging that we want to get across. And it comes with responsibility of who has the platform to use it properly and to use it with all it means. And we have a lot of power, of course, when we combine sports and all the um, messaging around it. Coming um, towards uh, another point, which is, uh, uh, I mean, we've seen Vinicius Jr. lately and in, in, in all of these um, <laughs> strange uh, behaviors of fans, actually not fans, people in the stadium. Um, there's a lot of talks. I've been speaking with uh, some uh, people who are uh, working since a year on a very robust plan to to come um, and involve all the stakeholders. So I see a lot of movement uh, from different federations as well to come with solutions, and uh, that is something that uh, really makes me happy because I think that at the end, um, in the world of football, whether it's on professional level, grassroots, I don't really separate them because whatever we're seeing on the highest level is a, is a mirror of society. So anything that happens in football for me, we've said it many times, is just what is happening in the daily life of many, many people. And we have a smaller world, so we can definitely make an impact. If we can adjust ourselves, we can set the example for society to follow. Um, and that's why I'm here, that's why I'm participating actively in, in the different organizations. Um, as Urs mentioned before, um, because if you want to make change happen, we need to be part of that change and we need to be sitting on those seats where we can have a voice, where we can um, share um, the thoughts of the people because many times the most important solutions will come exactly from the grassroots. Um, just a little example, I'm also an active uh, advisor um, for the police of the Netherlands. Uh, the Dutch police is also working on their own organization. They want to improve. They want to become more uh, 
inclusive, uh, etc. And we have a very uh, interesting uh, group of 12, 14 uh, members of those advisory and inspiration group um, for all backgrounds, different backgrounds. And um, I'm learning so much from that process because I think there's great, uh, there are good intentions and, and great uh, will to, to make change happen, but people many times don't really know how. And I think the how, you've been working on the how for many years. Uh, I wish I could have listened first to all of you, but I have to take a flight. So they pushed me to the first uh, <laughs> part of the session. Um, but I will definitely uh, go uh, into the details of the, the solutions, because that is exactly what we need. We need to start acting with the solutions, and we will make mistakes. Things will, you know, might work out, might not work out, but it's better to move, I say, in a certain direction that we know um, is far away from where we are today and in the, in, in the, in the right direction as well. In relation to coaches, um, I always wondered, and this is a conversation also for 15 years or so, why um, coaches are able to get their license and start um, working with the youth. But their aim and their goal is to become a professional coach. Uh, for me, this is a really wrong um, situation because it means that whatever they're doing with the youth is just to promote themselves. Um, it, I, would, I would really um, love to see in the future where we have a license that will allow you to coach youth players, young players, and you're not allowed with the license to be playing or working with adults and the professional world and vice versa. Make a decision. If you want to work with youth, you need to have the passion to work with them and you need to stick there. And I hope also the overall system, um, the clubs would reward those coaches better. So because at the end, everybody needs to eat. So most of the time is also a matter of very practical um, choices one wants to make to go up to earn a little bit more money. And I'm sure that systems can be found to also reward those coaches more that have passion and are actually educators that have the pedagogy um, capacity to to really work work with uh, youth coaches, uh, youth um, players, because the whole thing, grassroots or the youth academies and the professional level, uh, when I grew up, I had educators. I had a coach for a few years and he was a psychologist. He could not really shoot a ball. So he couldn't really show us how to shoot and what to do. He would take one of the guys who was good at something and say, okay, show them, and this is how you need to do it. But man, how much did I learn from him in terms of, of, of the values, um, the character building came mostly from this person uh, when it came on uh, the tournaments, discipline, all the, the values of sports. The basic things were set up by this coach, and he was not talking about tactics. He was not talking about, you know, technical aspects. It's about team, again, all the sport values and the things that will serve you for life. If we agree on this point, then we need to really revisit uh, whatever we're doing uh, with our courses. And it's not just the way if I'm talking about the whole world that is focusing on all oh, the tactics and the technical and the this and that. And at the end, we end up with players that only less than 1% will make it. The coaches that are actually um, empower to, to guide these young people uh, in the right direction. And if we talk more about tactics and technical things rather than building their character, there's something wrong. Because to become a professional football player as well, that's going to make the difference, your character, nothing else. So um, these are the things that I, I really talk a lot, a lot about. Um, what makes a difference between me and another very talented player that I had next to me when we were 10, 12, 14, and then all of a sudden, what, is, what, what makes the difference? It's the mindset. It's that, that um, discipline that I had more than others. It's about that desire, it's about the creativity that I was able to have um, because the environment was created for me to be creative. I'm talking about all these aspects because there was no racism discussion when I grew up. Imagine youngsters that talk about racism, we need to get awareness for racism, no. We need to make them aware about the values of sports. Sports is uh, the 
best tool, I'm not saying anything new here, everybody knows that, to really guide youth and to develop their brain and to develop their character. And to, so if we do all of that properly, we indirectly are tackling the issue. So rather than talking too much about racism, let's talk about how to be more human, how to be, what is friendship, what is, um, you know, teamwork. Uh, this is what I learned when I was younger. These were the things that they were putting on us every single time. And now, to give you the difference of what was happening in my time in Ajax and, and what is happening now more and more, and I'm giving Ajax as an example because the biggest club in the Netherlands and well known for the youth development, is that more former players are becoming youth coaches. But their aim is not to stay there. But the license allows them, and they need to start there because they cannot be with the first um, uh, licenses, uh, coaches on a high level. So in the system, there is something that needs to be, be changed because what is happening that many talents are not getting the right um, coaching because that coach is already thinking about something else thinking about the next step, how to grow, continue to do my course because with my next one I can become an assistant coach in the first team, etc., etc. And then on the grassroots level, I have to say Europe is, uh, is on a very good place in terms of infrastructure generally. So I, was, I went to the Netherlands last week with, the, with Feyenoord and everything and, and I saw Feyenoord has an amazing facility for the youth uh, and uh, even the amateur clubs. My brother, for example, is uh, leading an amateur club in the Netherlands. And those facilities are better sometimes than some <laughs> professional clubs in other countries. So, uh, but does that really impact the work that has been done with the youth? No. Actually, it was better to have very bad pitches and, you know, um, uh, no grass on the pitch <laughs> when we grew up. Uh, the wonderful project in, in Jordan, uh, when I see, you know, what they had before the pitch was put there. At the end, it's about the content, what we give them. So my last remark, um, and that's what I want to stress, is that uh, if we focus on what we want to achieve, and as an athlete, I had to do that every single match, I visualize what I want to achieve. In my visualization, there is no negatives, zero, because I attract what I think about. I attract what I talk about. So if we talk about racism so much, we're going to have more racism. <coughs> Let's talk about the things that we want. Let's visualize and discuss and put out the wording that we want to create. And I think then we will start seeing some different effects. Um, I thank you for your attention. Uh, I hope to uh, be able to really gather all the information of, uh, of today. Um, I won't be able to stay much longer, but uh, hopefully you will have a great, uh, great uh, uh, morning and afternoon with each other. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Clarence. Very inspiring, really. Um, I will book you much more for more uh, events now. <laughs> So, uh, as, as, as already mentioned now, uh, Van Wu will actually talk us through the project a bit and give more, more direct, um, uh, you know, concrete examples and tools that we could use. And we are looking forward to see the result of these three years of work. Please. No, no, we do it okay. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's a great honor to be here with you. Uh, in the heart of sport, in the heart of football, uh, thank you for being here. A big thank you to EFA Foundation for Children for the great collaboration and the hospitality and to all the partners. And of course, thanks to Clarence for making us the honor to be here and share his vision with us. And we are glad to see that uh, in many aspects we are aligned. 
Uh, in line with what uh, Clarence mentioned, the, the focus of my talk will be on the positive angle, meaning what is the value of football in shaping a better world? And I'm really glad to have heard that we should direct our message towards this angle. So how can we use sports to shape a better world? A few words about uh, who we are and what we do. Only one slide. Why we do what we do? Because we believe education is a powerful source, a powerful force for change. We really believe that. And we envision a just and sustainable world where people will learn and flourish. That's our vision, and it's in full alignment with what we do. At the same time, we know Education alone is not enough. We need structural changes. We need systemic approaches. And it's very important to focus on the positive. Focusing on the positive does not mean we ignore the negative. And there is racism. Racism is a reality. But focusing on the positive gives us hope. It gives us a source to look forward to. We work a lot with schools, a lot, and a lot with uh, many stakeholders in many initiatives with a big focus on values. The value of sport, respect, friendship, solidarity, collaboration, resilience, all these are fundamental qualities of what we do, what we should focus on. And uh, character education is one of the focus of this project. It's not just about tackling racism, because you cannot tackle anything without character. The focus of this project was to work with grassroots football coaches, youth clubs. We need to raise awareness for many people, we know that we have the big challenge of discrimination, but we have to focus on inclusion. We have to focus on building capacity for longer term and sustainability. Urs mentioned earlier all the partners, so I'm not going to go again and uh, uh, focus on all the resources developed for this project are available online. But we focus on grassroots for the very simple reason, that's where it's happening. That's where we need to start. And grassroots is where participation and the love for the game are the driving forces. The key words here are participation, as in inclusion, equal opportunities for all, and the love for the game. Okay? That's why it's important. A beautiful quote about football that I really wanted to bring on board because it really gives a good essence of why we are doing what we are doing, is that the thing about football, and the important thing about football, is that it is not just about football, you know? It's about broader values, it's about the broader value of sport, it's about participation, friendship, collaboration, respect, it's so much more. At the same time, we cannot ignore the problem. We should focus on the positive, but at the same time, we need to be aware and really aware that there is a problem. Okay. This brings the philosophy and approach behind this initiative that we were fortunate to have uh, co-designed with our partners and implemented for the last 30 months. Uh, it's, 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 its focus is on the possibilities that football gives to unite, to bring people together. During our planning phases, we did a lot of research and it's something that we've been working on for the last 20 years. And the idea is that we know there is 
a challenge out there we need to address. There are a lot of incidences, a lot of things going on, but we also know that the majority of the initiatives that get visibility target that small percentage of elite football. <clears throat> what Clarence mentioned uh, when we work with youth that on less than 1% will make it to elite football, but the problem exists in amateur and in uh, small and grassroots football, which is often either ignored or very underreported. There is not a lot of evidence for that, and, but we know it's real. So there is even more reason to focus on grassroots football. Building capacity of coaches, football managers, youth workers working with youth clubs and sports clubs, it's so important. We know from research that as in education that teachers teach the way they are taught and they emulate the behaviors of their teachers, the same applies in sports. Youth, athletes, they are impacted heavily by their managers, by their coaches. And that's why it's an important focus of the project. We try to bring together a collection of expertise. And in the consortium that we worked with, we had uh, really complementary expertise, including universities with capacity in academic training, UEFA Foundation for Children and the Fair Network that they do so much work in the field, and of course NGOs that do this work and work day to day in the grassroots football and youth clubs. Uh, at the same time, a lot of these, we wanted to develop resources that would be available for free for a very long time in many languages, and hopefully this will have a wider impact. The four main results from this uh, project include a report on the challenges and the approaches and what's actually happening in the partner countries. We develop education resources and training for coaches, managers, youth workers, and teachers who work in schools that they focus on sports and grassroots football. But a lot of these resources are not just for football. It's for sports, the value of sports. And we did develop toolkit with practical tips along with an e-learning platform. To do the research, we worked in all countries. We contacted desk research to look at policies, initiatives that are implemented. We conducted interviews, in-depth interviews, to see what is happening and what is the perception of the key stakeholders regarding possible solutions. One of the strengths of the project is the co-design approach, a user-centered approach, that we brought together all key stakeholders, which at the same time is one of the key lessons of this project, the importance of working with everybody with a positive message. We held focus groups and conducted the research, and then the key findings from the transnational report is that there is a big gap of knowledge and understanding of what racism is, what is inclusion, how can we promote inclusion, what are the practical steps we need to take for that, and what are all the factors that influence this. And it's systemic. It's not one thing. At the same time, we know that the behavior of coaches, educators, trainers, have a strong impact <coughs> on athletes, youth, and the young children long term. And we also know from a lot of research that the behavior of the manager and the trainer and the educator impacts for life young people and their perceptions about sports, about values, about uh, solidarity, about collaboration, about teamwork. These are very important. At the same time, we know that 
the expression of racism takes different forms and shapes. And not everybody understands how that is perpetuated. On the one hand, we definitely need to focus on the way we envision where we want to go and why we want what we want and why it's important. At the same time, we also know some of these things are basic human rights. There isn't much to negotiate. It's a basic human right, you know? But we need to tackle it. Also, there are incidents on a regular basis, but since grass food, uh, grass uh, root football is not well researched, we know that things are happening and we are ignoring them. So focusing on this was an important aspect. And the last key point that came from our focus group work and discussions is that we need more systemic and more engagement of authorities, ministries, associations, to actually push forward the key message for the value of sports, the value of football, and the importance to focus on character development and character education. You know, during the pandemic, there is a lot of research that shows that depression and mental health in youth skyrocketed. It's a huge problem with huge consequences that we rarely discuss. And the key challenge there is that I often get questions because we work a lot with parents' associations in small rural areas. And um, uh, when I go and discuss and they ask me, okay, what is it that you want your son to do? And, uh, and I tell them, if you ask me one thing I want them to uh, learn and develop is resilience. How do we develop that within the broader value of sport with respect, friendship, and so on? The focus of the resources, the next uh, five minutes, I will give you an overview of the resources because I would like to leave time for discussion and so uh, we're fine. Uh, the first part of the curriculum focuses on racism in football. What is it? How is it manifested? Because oftentimes we ignore this. We take a lot of things for granted. You know, a very famous anthropologist, they used to say, fish will be the last creature to discover water, you know, because it lives and breathes in water, and we take a lot of the things for granted. But the challenges that are there, oftentimes, we are not spotting them easily. Conceptualizing racism, the role of coaches, what is their role? How can they work collectively with the community and not in a solo performance, but how do we work with everybody involved to achieve the vision we have, where we want to go. And of course, a key element is the resilience and the character we need to help youth develop. It's of course a big challenge what Clarence mentioned, that we have a lot of coaches that they only use the transition from amateur and youth sports and grassroots for their next step in their career. There is nothing wrong to have a vision for your career, of course, uh, at the same time, we should not compromise the value of sport just with that. So it's an important element in the curriculum. In the toolkit, we have a lot of resources, including lesson plans and actual activities. Have in mind that a lot of the implementations uh, we did, and also in Cyprus, we worked a lot with schools and work with teachers who it's very useful for them to have a structured lesson plan. Here is the objective, here is how I'm gonna start, here is the next step, what this is the activity I will do, then how do I do the debriefing, what am I addressing, what are the issues we need to highlight, all these practical tips are needed. And of course, case studies and a lot of supplementary material. All these resources are free in the platform of the project, which registration and account creation is free, and the resources are available in four languages. And now we're looking for some supplementary uh, funding to ensure that we can add more languages down the road. 
I'll take an example, one of the modules, so how to make uh, a football team a space of inclusion. You know the focus, a space of inclusion, because that's the focus. And then we want them to be able to list the key causes of exclusion, because if you cannot tackle exclusion, it's difficult just to focus on inclusion, because exclusion and discrimination are realities. So we need to be aware of that. And how to recognize and document it and then apply specific methods to actually promote the inclusion aspect. And of course, understand the importance of monitoring and supporting and when incidents arise, to tackle them. We cannot just push them under the carpet because it's a reality. In many cases, we participated in the pilot implementations with discussions with uh, youth. You know, for example, causes of exclusion. What are some barriers? You know, of course, there are many more, but this is a classification of four of the main categories. You have the financial aspect. I remember when we were kids, we used to play in the fields, you know, uh, and we used to scrub so to make sure the field will be a bit even so we can play. The attitudinal ones, the physical, and of course the organizational and systemic aspects. And then to start conversations with youth, because it's not just about the coaches, managers, trainers. It's about everybody who plays the sport. And how do we sit down and have honest conversations? You know, we need a lot of empathy. We need to be able to sit and listen and appreciate each other's perspective. We don't have to agree. It's, it's impossible to agree on everything. But the basic human rights are there. Those we don't negotiate. So following, there are case studies within the uh, uh, activities implemented and how they can overcome some of these, how they are manifested, and what we all can do to redefine some of these aspects. Now let's take a quick look at some of the impact and the lessons we learned from this project. It's a small project implemented in five, six countries, but at the same time, uh, we really believe in the both short-term but long-term impact of this project. We trained more than 100 coaches so far, piloted it with hundreds of youth and students in many clubs and associations and schools in five countries. And of course, we had a lot of discussions of how to recognize and minimize uh, the incidents that prevent for true inclusion to take place. Here you see some of the implementations, uh, and then we also have several that were actually in the fields. And a lot of promotion and dissemination, and I think the event today with the live streaming and participation of all of you, and thanks again, Clarence, for your support of this, I think will be uh, good to actually voice the importance of these initiatives. So we, more than 50,000 individuals have been reached so far through the various dissemination activities and engagement with the project. But at the same time, we are working with schools and ministries to find ways that a lot of this can actually be adopted for the long term. Closing, I would like to focus on some of the key lessons we learned and the importance of initiatives like this. Probably the first one is the strong need for intervention that focuses at grassroots, because that's where it's happening, that's where it's for the participation and the love of sport are the driving forces. And that's where the scale and the masses are. And we need to start from that. Systemic approaches. Systemic, it means education and training is just one pillar. We have a lot of factors involved in promoting inclusion and shaping a better world. We have the policy level. 
We've had the constant monitoring and evaluation. If we don't monitor our work, we will not know the impact of our work. We need to bring together key stakeholders, and they are many. It's not only associations, it's not only the sports trainers, managers, coaches. It's parents' associations, probably a much more important stakeholder, because a lot starts with the family. We often hear debates about schools. Yes, schools are important, teachers are important, but Children are at school six out of the 24 hours. Where are the, the remaining time? Either family, friends, clubs. So we all have a role. We all have a shared responsibility. And at the same time, this is not to ignore the value of education, character education, and how you develop that. We did large-scale implementations for inclusion in other initiatives we were involved, a key policy experiment that we did in 100 schools in Europe, and we did measures before and after to see if specific interventions focusing on the positive, positive behavior support, can have an impact. And it does. It has an impact. Instead of focusing on the negative, you focus and reward the positive, and you highlight that. And there were improvements in school climate, reduction of, of violence and incidents and behavioral problems in schools. We know it works, but it's hard work, you know? It's not easy. And we know the world is a messy place, but at the same time, I think that we all can do little by little, we can have our contribution and hopefully help shape a better world. Closing. Just another initiative we're currently implementing and coordinators, building in a lot of the focus of inclusion as a key element, and particularly uh, focusing on inclusion, diversity, and integrity. Thank you so much for your time, and uh, I will look forward to the conversations later. Thanks a lot. Um, thank you, Bambu. Very, uh, very, uh, very interesting that actually science is confirming what you said. Uh, it's exactly what you said, you know, that we have to promote the role of educators that, uh, that have the impact on the children, but also to promote positive values actually have an impact everywhere. And, and I think that's, uh, we didn't plan for this. <laughs> it's really, it's great that it came out like this. Now, um, I think we'll have a short break because nowadays with the phones, the attention span has gone down uh, with everyone. So maybe it's good to have a, a short break of 15 minutes. And then we will continue. We have said that there's questions. I think what we will do, we'll have uh, um, Olivia speaking and Emilio, and then we will all have uh, here some time to take questions. We are good in time, and also it's good. Uh, I, uh, Clarence, I think, I think, can still be with us. So let's have a short break, 15 minutes. We come back, and we have two interventions and the discussion. Thank you so far. Thank you so much. Um, we, as I mentioned, we will have the next intervention. I will not introduce him. Olivia is a good colleague, good friend for a long time. He can introduce himself. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, just to introduce myself quickly, uh, my name is Olivier Dolia. I'm from Switzerland. I have been working for UEFA since 2008. Uh, firstly, in the coach education part, and uh, now in the elite youth football development, which is a, a division that is led by uh, another AC Milan uh, legend, is Vanemia Boban. But uh, I would like today uh, to try to show you what we are doing at UEFA in terms of football development, but also some case study, because aside of my job at UEFA, I'm also as a volunteer president of a football club in Geneva, which is called Etoile Carouge. So, sometimes it's better just to show an image because it speaks much more than a, a thousand of words. So this is like a, a under 12 club, a group pictures from a, from a team that you can really see in every country, in every city, in every villages. Uh, you have 40 players 
and two girls in this, uh, in this group picture. One thing is interesting is that this club, it has some clear principle from the, the, the beginning. The importance and the objective of the team is the fun, enjoyment, and really the friendship. So it's mean, it means that from the beginning of the season, the development of the player is much more important than the result itself. And they have also a specificity that we will uh, come back after, after on this, is that the next season, every player on that picture can choose whether he wants to play two training sessions a day, uh, a week, or four training sessions a week. Again, this is a philosophy of the club. So for the time being, just try to keep this image uh, into one side of your, um, your head because we will get back to it. First, first now, I would like to just to share the overall mission of the Football Development Unit is to provide a high quality technical program and support system designed to improve football development throughout Europe and as a reference, ideally beyond. To do so, we have four different uh, pillars. And as you can see, there is a, a connection. Uh, they are interconnected uh, each other. The first one is the grassroots football. We spoke already quite a lot about grassroots football and its importance. Also the coach education, better coaches, more coaches. Clarence uh, spoke before also about the importance of the coaches. We will come back to it afterwards. There is another... Um, uh, subdivision, which is the elite youth player, how to optimize the development of the, the top talented player, and one other, which is the match and performance analysis. It's more like uh, game analysis, tact tactical uh, analysis, and all the data around the player development. So let's start with the first um, subdivision, which is the grassroots football. Here we have identified uh, let's say, six major uh, area, which is the football in school. We spoke, uh, we touched on uh, before a little bit on that. The grassroots coach education, very important. The club development, the child and youth protection, the disability, disability football, and the flexible format, and player pathway. Here, I would like to switch to... Um, to a club case uh, that I was facing when, uh, when I took the presidency of this club uh, in Geneva. You, you have like a dream vision of a club uh, and after a couple of months you start realizing that some parents are complaining, some coaches are complaining. Uh, every stakeholder of the club, they have something to say. When everything is working fine, unfortunately, you never get the feedback is only the negative feedback that you, uh, you receive. But we tried with the, with the board to, to tackle all the, the small uh, problems, the one after the others. But with this, you never get better. You are just trying to, uh, to solve the situation and waiting for, for another one. So you have to, to step back and to think about what kind of club I want to have. What's the value? of the club I want to, uh, to give to all the stakeholders. So that was something very, uh, very important for, for, for me. It was first of all to be sure that uh, the philosophy of the club was the, white, uh, the, 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 the one we, we wanted. It means value that you have to share and the code of conduct that you have to share with the player, with the parents, uh, with yourself as well, because you, you are the one responsible for it. Then, one thing that was very important, and we, we, we mentioned it before, is when you are president uh, of a club, you sign the contract of the player and the coaches, especially the coaches. So you are the one responsible when you hire a coach at the lowest level. is the right one. The coach of uh, a grassroots level or a senior team or an elite youth one is, is, is absolutely not the same. And we, we mentioned it before. For a grassroots club, I don't know, I don't need someone who is like impressive in tactical. I need like a half trainer, but half educator or maybe half second parents. 
So that's very important also to keep in mind to try to solve some problems uh, at club level. One thing that was also um, uh, a little bit strange and I, f I felt uh, sad at the beginning is when the kids come to the training session. You have one or two or three kids that are fully well equipped with the Real Madrid, the Barcelona, the day after they have Bayern Munich, and you have some that have always the same t-shirt, the same short, with hole inside. So a decision that we took uh, in the board, it, uh, is, it was that for the next season, a package will be given to every single kid, and we have 600 kids. A package is 30 euro. It means the bag, the jacket, the t-shirt, the short, and the socks. It's a small thing, but at every training session, the kids are equal. And you create this unity uh, amongst the team. And don't think too much about the, the money to, uh, to invest. We are speaking about 18,000. It's, it's quite a lot, but it's the better visibility of a club. 600 kids that are traveling, that are going to school with your, with your logo, that's invaluable. So I don't want to touch too much on coach education. Uh, again, we have four different paths. Part is the, the education pathway. Uh, it means that to coach at a certain level, you need a certain license. You have the, the, the grassroots license, then the B license, the A license, and the pro license, which allow you to, uh, to train at the top level. The coach educator development is another side of it. The development of female coaches, very important nowadays. You see the development of the women's football is, uh, is tremendous. So we, have, we need also more uh, female coaches on board. And the reality-based learning, I will not touch on it, is the methodologies, how you implement the training session on the field with your, with your player. The, uh, the elite youth football is, uh, is uh, mainly my, um, my duty at UEFA. So we have three different pillars. is the Elite Youth Academy. Uh, another is a project for all 55 member associations that are affiliated uh, uh, to UEFA. We give a certain amount of money, but we have to follow uh, where the money goes. Is for investing in elite youth uh, project and the international development tournaments, which is designed for the under-15 and under-16 national team, boys and girls, is to better prepare them for when the competition will start at under-17 level. But again. Here is a non-official tournament, this development tournament. Development is more important than the competition. I said that before. So we have created a rule, for example, that during this tournament, every player has to play a minimum of 90 minutes across three games. Because we don't want a player to stay on the bench for, for the duration of the tournament. On the Elite Youth Academy, to give you just a, a little overview on, uh, on, on this, uh, it's for few associations that don't have a club who can run an academy, is the association who is running an academy. It's like a full board accommodation uh, with the school, uh, with the, the, the football, the medical follow-up, the nutrition. So it's a real concept of an academy for the top 25 player uh, of the category under 15 and under 16. So imagine having 50 people in one center, you will have definitely some issues. Uh, but it is important to be proactive on this, and every academy like, like this one, they have a welfare manager, someone who will be close to the player, who can discuss with the player, because problems might uh, happen, and also we are speaking about boys at 14, 15 years old. They can be homesick, uh, they can have problems with the school, uh, so it's important to have a person that can surround them uh, a maximum. Then this part, I, I will not touch on too much, is, is more like match performance analysis. It's more for the coaches, and uh, it's, it's just uh, um, some reports that we make available for the coaches on, uh, on top uh, European tournament or, or games. But you remember the, the picture we saw at the beginning of um, the presentation? That I, so let's, let's keep to this picture. Perhaps someone has a, has a clue on the little young player on the left side in the first row. This one. Again, we were speaking about how many of one, uh, 
club will, will be successful is 1% or maybe 2%. But this one was part of the, the, the 1%. Three years after, he was uh, part of the national team of uh, Norway. And uh, a nice coincidence, he was playing against England. And uh, actually, they are almost best friends, but teammates at Manchester City. So um, that's also the kind of beauty of, um, of the game. But more interesting, here we are speaking about this 1%. But what happened to the uh, 39 other players on the picture? An impressive number on that club is that we had five boys and one girl who made a professional career on that picture. And that's an amazing number. It means that the philosophy behind the club, you remember the friendship, uh, the possibility of having two training sessions, four training sessions a week, they managed to keep this team all together. So that's the number of the one who made a, a, a career. But again, an impressive number is that 38 of the 40 players continue to play until the adulthood. And that's, that's really uh, exactly what we try at UEFA together with the, asso uh, the association to keep as many people as possible into the game, whatever the level they have, but to keep them in, um, in the game. And uh, for the ones who are not successful at the, the top level, is what you mentioned before, what a learning life. It's so important for, for those boys that we can, and the girls that we can guide them to the life together. So, from the, the, I, I don't want to be too long because there were so many interesting things and I don't want to repeat them uh, nowadays. But I was really touched on uh, the, positive, the positive side of um, the, the sport, the value, and especially in, in, uh, in football. And I would like to, to show you just the last picture of uh, what's the reality in the club. We are not speaking about discrimination, racism, that's an example of uh, our women's team who get promoted to the second division. Believe me, in the dressing room on, on that picture, there is no question of discrimination. or They will be friends for life. And that's, for me, the most powerful uh, tool that football can bring. is like uh, a sharing, uh, sharing emotion, sharing a positive, negative uh, result brings you like as a, as a real teammate. So thank you very much for your attention and um, looking forward for your question afterwards. <clears throat> Merci beaucoup, uh, Olivier. Thank you so much. Also here, again, you know, that the example that you showed that in a club that actually fosters inclusion and, and, and you know, friendship that actually is so successful, because today a club who has almost everyone who continues to play until adult, is, is, it doesn't exist, basically. So I'm very grateful for, for this uh, example, and, um, and it confirms just the two interventions that we had before. Now we're going to a bit more local and, and uh, from global to local uh, and, and uh, practical level. So we have the pleasure to now have uh, Emilio, uh, who is uh, working here as a coach. He's under pressure because he's President came also here, so I hope, uh, feel, hopefully it will <laughs> it'll be. Otherwise, I will take him out if it's too much pressure, Emilio. But Emilio, please come on stage. And Emilio will speak in French, so if you need translation, please. Bonjour à tous. Well, good morning, everybody. It is a bit difficult indeed. So sorry if I am not very uh, comfortable speaking to you. You know, I'd rather speak to uh, changing within a changing room. So my name is Emilio Hernandez. I'm almost 56, and over the last two years, I've been an educator rather than a coach in a regional uh, club, the US, uh, the FC Prangin. It's very nearby. After what we listen to, it is very difficult to be able to add uh, something because a lot of things were said already and very well said. So I prepared a, a short text that I would like to read, which uh, talks about 
everything that was said until now and that we could talk about. And my experience as a football amateur. So dear organizers for the conference, dear friends, I'm very honored to have the opportunity to talk to you as participants to this major event. It is very encouraging to see that there's so much interest in this conference about racism, inclusion, and equality in football. And this especially, since it comes from uh, such a major institution within football, that is the UFA. These issues are unfortunately very well, very present in our daily lives and uh, with the media even more so in the world of football. So it is absolutely essential to look at it and to work together to solve any type of issues at all levels, not only at the professional level, I believe that the, you know, the uh, grassroots football represents 92% uh, uh, of the football amateurs and lovers. The club I have been working uh, for for the last 12 years, FC Prentions, has been working for a long time on all the subjects of inclusion, uh, equality, the fight against racism via different things that they've been able to organize and that we'll be able to talk uh, uh, about. It is really something we are extremely keen on. My president is here today, and any coach, any person coming to our club before doing anything else has to sign a charter in which all these issues are uh, talked about. And if uh, the person doesn't want to see in that charter, it's nothing to do uh, in that club because it's a family-oriented club. It is a family, actually, for some of the people that are here, Karin, uh, Tanya. They were able to see what's going on in our club, the life of our club, and I hope they were able to observe that our passion is to be able to work with the youth in the best possible conditions. As a real fan of football and really keen on equality, I believe that sports can change uh, uh, things that can make sure that people come together regardless of their origin, their gender, or their sex orientation. However, racism still prevails in football in the pitch or uh, in the public. So it is essential to unite our efforts and uh, regardless of the level we are at, uh, I would like to uh, cast some light on the major role of the promotion of the culture of equality and inclusion within the football clubs, the different institutions among the fans and everything that surrounds the life of football. I would also like to highlight the positive impact, because it was said before by Clarence, by Olivier, by everybody. Instead of talking about the issues of racism and everything that stains football, we should be talking about what's positive in the world of football. And today... The fact that we have a real mixity in a team is a major added value in the team that I'm coaching. It used to be a second league uh, team. And out of the 24 players, there are easily seven or eight and different nationalities. Maybe fewer Swiss than the rest of uh, European footballers from Asia or Africa or wherever they come from. To share an example with you, I'm sorry, I'm a bit lost in my notes. So to share an example with you, which I believe helped us beef up the fight against uh, discrimination and against racism. At the time, I was uh, coaching young children, junior B, and here in Switzerland, before and after the game, children have to face each other and uh, shake hands. 
maybe it was a bit radical at the time, but there was one child of the opponent uh, team, and I'm not going to give his name, it doesn't matter, refused to shake the hand of one of my players because of his uh, skin color. We did not hesitate half a second. We just left the pitch and decided not to play. I think I think this is the quiz, quickest way, the strongest, strongest manner to make people understand that racism has uh, no right to exist in uh, football and that any child has, to, has the right to play regardless of the uh, color of his skin. Thank you. It is important to uh, mention these incidents to the adult population in charge of teams, uh, to tell uh, the parents, to tell uh, the teachers, and also to the people that are in charge of the game in the pitch, in the field. If one of those things occur, you have to go to the referee, to the coach, or whoever, but one cannot tolerate such a thing. As I often say to my boys, do not let this negative experience uh, take out your courage or um, do not let that uh, endanger your values. So I want to highlight uh, education as a means to fight against racism. You must have an adapted training to the players, to the coaches, uh, to the different uh, official staff and to the fans in order to promote mutual understanding, respect and solidarity. And I would also like to encourage all discussions on the way media can play a role in terms of equality and on the role of inclusion, making sure that the media coverage is fair, which is not always the case. Altogether, I am convinced that such conferences as this one will be a major opportunity to motivate people and to inspire people to uh, take actions uh, in the world of football. I'm very pleased to be able to contribute to that and to talk about this issue with you and to encourage dialogue and actions. This is the only way we can hope a positive change, a sustainable change uh, in football as in any other sport, where each individual has to be treated with respect, equality, regardless of his race, his religion, or his culture. And to finish, I would like to talk to the people that experienced this situation as the one that I described. If you need support, to face such situations, you can perfectly turn to different resources within your community, support groups such as the associations we just saw, and different departments, uh, you know, uh, advisory boards. You are not on your own. There will always be people to help you to face this situation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Emilio, and congratulations for the work you do. I know that there are a few questions from the public. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Emilio, and, and uh, congratulations also to, uh, to what you uh, have to achieving in your club. So I would uh, actually invite uh, the presenters to come on stage, and we will take some questions from the public, uh, if there is any. Um, and please, you can, you can uh, introduce yourself, ask a question either in English or in French, and we have our, uh, our presenters here. Please, if you want to sit here. Here we have our famous microphone. You can just speak into the microphone um, and ask your questions. <laughs> Good. Voila. Ah, it's already going strong. Maybe, Karin, can you help me with that so that I can go on stage? <coughs> okay, perfect. Um, is it working? Yeah, okay. Go ahead, go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Hani. I'm uh, 
part of the Happy Feet team. We organize football camps for charity in uh, Cope, next to 10 minutes away from here. And I basically had a question uh, for a few of you. You touched upon racism. Um, so my question is now, how can we effectively implement initiatives or projects to make real change because the way I see it, change is most effective when it comes from intrinsic motivation. Um, however, all the um, projects we're doing now are more coming from institutions or an extrinsic, uh, let's say, way. Um, so how can we, is, is there a way that we can bridge the gap and really make change come from within? Um, yeah, I don't know if, if it's clear or not, um, my question. Takers for this question. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, happy feet, yeah. Just continue to do what you're doing. <laughs> That's the best way to to tackle whatever um, we've been talking about. As we think all agree here is that um, the change comes with setting the right example, talking uh, and transmitting and creating the identity that you want to represent. That for me is the way. Um, so whatever you're doing and it's working and it's have a positive impact, amplify your message. Go deeper in it. Make your identity even more known and stronger. That is that is what I would suggest. Yeah. Just one sentence on that. Uh, be the change you want to see. So start with that. It's great. That's okay. So. Emilio? I will answer in French. I just wanted to say that it's a matter of education, and it starts with the very young child. As we said, you know, you must know where you want to go and what you don't want to do in a club, but it starts at a very early age. Unfortunately, in Switzerland, we have an issue. Our parents, for most of them, work, the, the parents of the children, so the uh, young people are uh, going to the school and when they are not at school, they are in the streets, they are on their own with their friends and I think that the education should start there. We focus on the education and it's the, that's the base, it really should start in education and fortunately a lot of parents today in Switzerland, both parents work and they don't have enough time for this, so this is an important part of the education that needs to be addressed. It's happy. I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a, fr a French-speaking person, but I'm finding myself in translating. That's very good. Anyway, next question. Next question. Um, hi, my name is Alex. I'm working for a foundation that promotes um, sports offers, uh, free, uh, free sports offers for children and young people. Um, we talked a lot about um, education, a grassroots level. I totally agree with you, it has to start from there. But I'm interested to have your opinion uh, on the, the role of the, the professional players and prof prof professional football, sorry, um, where it's a world of uh, performance, money, media. And what, what is your opinion on the, on the professional um, players? What is, the, what, is, what is the question? I mean, what's, what, what's the, the, the role of a professional player? Um, as, as an example, I mean, not everybody is as involved as you are in, in, in some kinds of battle. Um, in a world of uh, where everything is based on performance and it starts yeah. from like when you're six, seven years old, you're not happy to not play. You, you're you're based, always based on performance, I think. Yeah, I mean, I heard something about uh, development. Uh, it's a very interesting discussion. Um, what does development mean? Uh, I'm not sure if I even agree on that. Players have to play even in the youth because being on the bench the whole tournament might be exactly that player will, that will succeed later because that creates resilience and maybe more motivation. So I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I know the intentions, So, but it's an open discussion. Many will have different opinions about it. I know players that didn't play a lot when, when we were growing up, but at the end, he ended up playing on a professional level for, for 20 years, and the others that were always playing didn't even reach the first team of, of, the, of, of um, the club. So um, I, we are an end product. 
everything we're talking about is the education uh, on grassroots level. I started grassroots as well. So whatever I got and what I became is a result of my, my process. Uh, so when you see the professional players today, that is the end result of whatever the system has produced. And I believe players are doing too much to battle this. Too much responsibility on the players. They are walking off the pitches. They are doing whatever. They're using the social media today. I mean, they're so active. Um, but the real platforms are different. The real platforms are in the rooms where decisions are being made uh, on football level. We're talking about FIFA, UEFA, the federations locally. D there is where the real power is to make changes in regulations, in, you know, um, 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 well, yeah, I, I'm not a, f a fan of sanctions and stuff, but if that would be needed, yes. Because, for example, if we have situations in stadiums, for me, that whole box needs to be emptied immediately. Same as they walked off the pitch, why not empty the stadium? You do it one time, nobody will follow, I think, uh, in mass to follow those few idiots that are uh, behaving in a certain way. So I think we need to start seeing what players are actually doing, acknowledging more, because I believe they're doing so much for so many years, from Eto to, um, uh, what's his name, um, Dani Alves, to now the latest is Vinicius Lukaku. Yep. And it's not only black and white thing, because that is also not really the issue. It's not just black and white. It's 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 really Really, the the overall discrimination and racism altogether, right? Um, so, my my view is um, we should give more space for the players, actually, s real platforms, and also for the former players to be part of the change, because we have lifted from grassroots on. We know maybe much more than many would would think. Anything to add, please? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much for for your presentations. Uh, I'm Thomas. I'm working uh, at UEFA in anti-doping, uh, anti-doping education and prevention. And uh, j'ai une question pour Monsieur. Uh, uh, I have a question for Mr. Hernandez. And this is in relation to the incident that took place in your game. The National Association, did it take uh, any sanction, any measures? What were the consequences after that game where you refused to play? What was the result of uh, this incident when you left, actually? Don't and if the, if the regional association, what was the consequences of this? Alors oui, des conséquences, il y en a eu. Yes, there have been consequences. The first consequence in our club is that we set up a real official manner to deal with that. If there is a racist incident in a game, our team, and my president is there to confirm that, will leave the pitch. That's for sure. This is something that is deeply rooted in the club nowadays. It has consequences, and that was that in the club now they have taken this policy that if there is an incident like this, they will keep, they will leave. The Vaudois Association of Football uh, actually uh, deleted some of the points of the opponent teams. Uh, there was no classifications, but they gave us the game. And the president of the opponent uh, team, and as, I, as you can imagine, it was a bit heated. You know, at the start, a child does not, does not know what, a race, what racism is. Uh, so the father of the child came to shout at me and said that if uh, his child did not want to shake the hand of another player, it was his problem. And I said that the problem was not the child, it was the father. And automatically, the club, the opponent club, excluded the father and the child from the club. 
about the club and give, given the match to Branja, but uh, on this level that's not the most important. Um, but there, of course, there was some heated discussions uh, on the field, uh, he said, and uh, the, 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 the trainer or the coach from the other side came and why they, they had done this, the, this child, uh, okay, it's not his fault, uh, if it, it's his decision, and he said, yeah, it's not the, the, the fault of the child, it's the fault of the parent, and uh, this, you know, uh, this should not happen, and then actually the, the parent and the child were excluded from the club, from the other club. Voilà. Okay. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Yeah, question to also ask my second question, maybe more for, for Clarence. Uh, it, I mean, it's a very good example to see that at domestic and very local level, the consequences that uh, the association, the continental association took, but also maybe what's your message for maybe the people from UEFA also here. We are also a regulator in uh, European football and what can UEFA do maybe more to tackle not this racism but maybe more promote positive values as you, as you said uh, as a governing body for European football. Yeah, let's not discuss that here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, don't so put me, don't put me in a place. <laughs> uh, but believe me, we, we will have those discussions and we are actively, um, uh, let's say, trying to make the contribution. Um, and I will, I will say something about it. Just to add, because I heard there was a punishment here, right? But we also need to look at the punishment needs to be uh, considering after a recovering process. Otherwise, we are being exclusive again. Because if that child made that mistake at that point, the learning comes from the exclusion, but then there has to be a recovery process. Because we need to give people a second chance and see if they learned, especially when they're young. On the highest level, that is a different story. But as I said, if we do these, these actions on grassroots, in the youth, Believe me, the end result will be much better. We won't have those stupid fans in the stadiums if we would push on a global level on this educational process. And this is real education. This is what it's about. This is, for me, football starts all right there. And the things have been done with people like himself. Um, just a general uh, comment is that the institutions like UEFA, FIFA, and, and other federations, local federations, there is one big problem at the moment. It's not on the priority list. As long as this problem has not been put on the priority list, we will run behind our own tail. Once we acknowledge any acknowledgement, I just said it in the interview, any acknowledgement that we, a problem that we have, if somebody gets sick, what does that person do? Goes to the hospital or to the doctor. It becomes priority. We don't go to the doctor every day. We are at a stage we need to go to the doctor, so it needs to be put on the priority list. That means I'm acknowledging the, pro the problem, and that means the solution starts. Without acknowledgement, we will be trying to do some things to improve, but it will never really get to a point of that impact that we're looking for. Another question. I'll go here and I'll tell okay. to you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ella Joannes. I'm, a, I'm an external um, consultant for UEFA. Um, I have a, an, a question. Um, what can be the solutions when uh, racism takes another proportion when, for example, full stadiums, what we saw about, for example, Vinicius uh, Jr., uh, when it's not one person, it's not 10 people, but it's whole stadiums that uh, are racist. Uh, what can be the solutions to that kind of uh, bigger problem of it's it's much bigger numbers than only one dollar incident here. When it's it's recurrent problems and with lots more people. So what can we do to to solve that kind of uh, much bigger issue? Thank you very much for your answer. 
I, I, I will take this question because we have discussed this. We are here, you know, it's, it's an important question. I'm not 100% sure it's the whole stadium. It's always, as, as it was said today, some idiots. It's not, I think it's not that part, but uh, what we are discussing here, it starts at that level. And if we start at that level, it will help with the higher level as well. Uh, just addressing deducting points or all discussion we have is said we are not going progressing, we're not going to actually address the problem accurately. I think we have to do more on, on that level as well, but I, I don't know what your opinions are. I have one comment. But, yeah. uh, just to second what was just said, because a whole steady one, or a lot of people in a stadium behave the way they do. It doesn't mean they all believe the same or they share values that are the same. There is a lot of research behind that and a lot of social psychology angle when you have 10 idiots that get to carry away the whole crowd and how the masses behave when you have a few who trigger that. So I wouldn't agree that's the whole stadium are racism, uh, racist. No, no, I, I agree, but it was a practically a whole stadium that acted that way, so I think that's, that's your point. Um, but the reason for that is that when it was still a small group, no action was taken. So the others feel uh, legitimized to just join. Exactly. That's a mass behavior. People don't think. Oh, okay, I'm part of it, so I'm doing. So I, I think that it goes back to, because Vinicius, just to use him as an example, it has been for two years that he was going through these things, and it was not a whole stadium in the beginning. Um, then we need to look, okay, these people also are very frustrated with their own life and society, so how is the society actually? We know that, again, many times people come with their frustrations to the matches and they are <laughs> letting it all go there, which doesn't justify the behavior, but it goes back to the point that we need to go into solutions where this is prioritized. Exactly what I said before, because the Spanish Federation, La Liga, whatever they have not been doing enough has permitted this to grow. So it, it goes back to, yeah. Um, so my name is Zora Shafiq, and I'm the program director for Action for Development. Uh, I'm coming actually, I'm originally from Afghanistan, um, and uh, I live in Geneva. Um, uh, I run an organization uh, and program for street working children in Afghanistan, and maybe it's a little bit of different uh, area uh, compared to what has been discussed today, but it was very, very much um, important, the issues that you have uh, push today towards uh, inclusion. Um, my question would be um, a little bit uh, maybe also echoing the question that we had uh, a few minutes before, but also in terms of situation for the girls in Afghanistan and education uh, for girls which has been uh, banned by uh, the current de facto authorities in Afghanistan, uh, so what would be uh, the reflection or the opinion and what would be the activities that you would like to propose uh, or a message that you would like to give to the world? Because at the moment, uh, it, it's really important, I guess, for us that we have the support from, uh, from all the world to improve the situation for girls and women in Afghanistan. So I, I would like to know what would you recommend and what will be your message? Thank you. <laughs> no, I mean, we know we had a wonderful conversation before and, and uh, with Urs uh, in one of our uh, meetings with the board, we, uh, we got a uh, um, yeah, very um, strong message uh, from, uh, from your organization and uh, really um, admire uh, what you're doing for those girls. Uh, we know the situation is pretty delicate. Um, and as I said to you before, the message is all about keep on believing. I mean, you are most likely the most important person uh, to keep this alive and to keep the message alive, to keep the communication alive, and to keep us engaged. Um, 
the commitment, um, I think the commitment is there from our side. Um, as much as we can to use all the tools available, there's a big difference 20 years ago and today, you know, where uh, uh, internet has, in this occasion, can be really a positive uh, note um, in the whole whole case, um, where on the other side, <laughs> internet is causing a lot of damages. But in this case, I think we can really, um, and we should really maximize everything that we have to give those girls that are under your wings um, the opportunity to, to really reach at a level where they can be the next advocates to for change um, uh, in, in in your country. Um, I don't like to make promises and all other stuff, but I can just say that the commitment uh, from the foundation is there, um, and that means that uh, um, you're not alone in this uh, in this journey and this struggle. Um, and I want to compliment you again for for everything that you're doing, and also the girls that are keeping um, dreaming and uh, and uh, believing in in a better future. If I can just add something on, um, I think, yeah, as, as you mentioned, promises is, uh, is, is most delicate things to, to do. But in Europe, uh, we had also in the past, uh, and still, some, some, uh, some country where uh, women's football is difficult to build on. And, uh, but the situation 20, 15 years ago has developed so much. Uh, and so it, it means hopes, definitely. And uh, there are also a um, uh, way to, uh, to improve the football. Um, from some association, they started with mixed football because women's football on its own uh, were not existing. So there are always possibilities is the wish, which is uh, the, the most important. Thank you. I'm Chris Momo. I'm the president of the Global Alliance for Sustainable Sports. So it's an organization promoting sustainability in the sport um, industry. Um, I just wanted to ask you a question. Um, what I have um, understand from the presentation is that we emphasize we work a lot with the grassroots. So that's, I would say, the, the, the bottom-up approach, which is good. We're laying the foundation for the next generation of sports persons, sport leaders. But on the other hand, as you also clearly mentioned, we should not forget about the top down because the power lies in the hands of the federation, I mean, the, the governing bodies. Um, my concern, of course, uh, without really sounding pessimistic, I just wanted to ask, don't you think that we wasted a little too much time to tackle this issue in racism? Because not, I mean, yesterday, I guess I was reading, uh, two German international for the uh, under 20, 23 uh, who missed a penalty against Israel, and they were actually um, racially abused. I mean, uh, they had all the, 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 the negative commands, racism, etc., from their citizens, from their fellow citizens. So the German citizen actually um, accusing, uh, insulting, assaulting their, their, their players. Now, my concern is that with the, the, the social media that is really amplifying again everything it's not just about stadium because you know we can have as um, uh, Mr. Hernandez said you know there is a, an issue and racism on the stadium okay you take a decision and then you you you, you leave but what happens you know on social media is because you know it's another issue so without sounding pessimistic don't you think that we've wasted too much time and that it will be really difficult to, you know, to, to win this battle. That's that's my um, my question. Yeah. Well, you know, um, 150 years ago we were walking with chains. Mm. Today we don't have chains anymore. So uh, pessimism. There's no room for that. I think there's only room for um, believing uh, in in a better future and working hard to make that happen without pointing fingers because I think that that is an approach um, that is counter-effective. I think the finger-pointing uh, approach to what 
people, institutions, leaders aren't doing is counter-effective because people go in defense and they don't start moving. So my personal approach with my organization, with my foundations, with my initiatives and the things I support, I always say if we want to be inclusive, first of all, we need to be able to be inclusive first and not judgmental. Um, the things that have been happening, um, let's say, over the last decades uh, is nothing new. I missed the penalty in the Netherlands and I suffered, believe me, big time from the reactions as today. So meaning nothing has changed in that sense. Still today, um, I accepted to become a supervisory board member of the Federation after I wasn't selected for eight years in my prime. So there are things that I'm not, I'm not giving it a name. I'm just giving you some facts. But I'm thinking about what are we going to leave behind. It's about the legacy. Once you start thinking about what you're going to leave behind and about the legacy, any of our efforts always is a step forward. Otherwise, those before us, how do we show respect to them if we start thinking that things will be difficult to change today with everything that we have today differently from them? They had to march on the streets. They had to do all kinds of stuff, labor without payment. Every time I think about those things, okay, let them boo, let them boo in the stadiums. I can handle that. That's how I did it. But others are emotionally less capable, so we need to create this environment where they all feel more safe. Um, but I'm actually very optimistic of what I'm seeing because I see more awareness. The discussion is on the table in the federations, in the institutions, in football, in the dressing rooms. And I'm not talking about dressing room of the players. Dressing rooms meaning management. Yeah. Um, so that was not there when I started to play the game on a professional level. So I see a lot of progress, maybe not as efficient yet, but I think that we need to believe in it, that things will happen and will change, and not for the 20 years from now. I can see that within the next 10 years, we will have made huge progress. Yeah. Bonjour. Um. So, hello. I'd first like to thank you for your warm welcome. And secondly, it's uh, more about sharing something than a question. So, in the same way as Emilio, I'm much more comfortable in front of my team. My name is Zanny Boucar. I'm active with uh, the Vaudois uh, female football when we know each other, so in this area. And I'd like to bring something to the table with the girls sometimes in championships uh, and sometimes we play in the uh, so boys championships. It's very difficult and we pay about 10 matches. And when I uh, so I take a snapshot of these 10 matches, there's about eight matches where things go well. They are very strong in characters, but two where things go very badly. Uh, so uh, the words that they use. And something that I'd like to bring back is about rituals. We have rituals that associations have uh, implemented. So there's a, a check, uh, hand checking uh, system. And when we see how the match uh, develops, I'm uh, so wondering what the real meaning of this is. Uh, so why do we shake hands or check uh, hands when, in the end, the match doesn't take place very well? And my phone just uh, shut off, but in the pictures that I took, 
something that I really like is the attitude. So I see this uh, uh, sexism is uh, to be uh, banned just like racism. And uh, to me, this is a form of exclusion. Maybe it's not about all uh, male teams. But to go back to what uh, Mr. Zidoff was saying, to develop player character, and this is what I'd like to finish upon. So I uh, de uh, help the girls develop uh, character and force of character in the face of these uh, attitudes. Of difficulties, so this is very important to have. So I understand there's no question, but question. Just uh, an issue that he wanted to bring back. Thank you very much for this. Um, I want to thank all the public. Uh, I want, first of all, to talk at our presenters and all what has been brought in today. Uh, it was a, a great, uh, a great uh, experience, and it was very great to hear all this. Um, so thank you all for coming, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you, and have a very good day and a good weekend. Thank you.